This is the Lean Builders Hoots on the Ground podcast with absolutely, positively no bullshito. Join us as we dig into exactly what lean construction is and how we can use these concepts and strategies in the field. This podcast will be different as we journey to job sites and mine the minds of lean builders, all in effort to pass forward building knowledge from those who have put their time in to learn a better way. Because that's just what lean builders do. You want me to start at the beginning there? Yeah, as far uh, back because, as you want. Yeah, because the a lot of how you, you view life and how you view uh, the world at large and people within it, uh, the lenses through which you look uh, are, are kind of based on, on your, your, your upbringing and your values and your belief systems and whatever that they were established quite early on. Uh, and, and, I, and I've had them, everybody has them, but I've, I've had that a lot where you, know, you, you grow up with some paradigms that you've got to shake off. And one of my paradigms was the fact that I was, I was born in Scotland, West Coast, into a, a family. It was, it was working class, nothing special, no car, no holidays, not nothing, not poor, but, but nothing. My mum, my mother, had, had met a guy and uh, I was born at a wedlock, never met my father, so no, no fatherly values to draw direction from or guidance or whatever. But I was brought up with my, my grandparents, maybe my mother and I live with my grandparents. And my grandfather was a miner, uh, a big old tough guy, and yeah, you know, loved his cycling, loved his, you know, his outdoor world. And I, and I guess that's where I got a passion for outdoors and, and cycling and whatever. And I still do that to this day. As a fact, coming in early, early age, I was outdoors to whatever. And, and, in, and in the same pattern, I was acutely conscious that everybody else had a dad, and I didn't have a dad. And I, it gave me a driver in life. To, to push myself. I brought a huge stigma upon myself. This was unacceptable. Today, it, it means nothing. You know, illegitimacy means, means absolutely zero. It's, it's not a big thing. And a lot of people might listen to this and think, what the hell is he talking about? You know, there's, there's nothing. But back in the 60s Scotland, you know, West Coast, Presbyterian, Protestant Scotland, and that, whew, it was like almost the leper. Or oh, so I thought, and that was not the case. But I had that self-belief, oh, geez, I, I've got to be better than everybody else. I've got to be faster than everybody else. I've got to be cleverer than everybody else. And I had this huge weight on my shoulders that I carried around. That, you know, I just had to, just to be the same as everybody else, I had to try a lot harder. Of course, it's total bullshit. You look back and you think, what a load of bullshit that actually is. That I lived under such pressure that I put myself through, through so much. I used to train three, four nights a week for, for martial arts or athletics or volleyball or whatever the hell the sport was, just to make sure that I was on top of my game. And, uh, and so on and on that, that, that went. And, and I say, total bullshit, but not a bad driver. It makes you do things that you, you, uh, you ordinarily might not have, have thought. Uh, I was successful as a kid and I was a good sportsman and... Uh, this is a very interesting point because it brings me to the construction side of things. There's a because of that work ethic, my family saw work and employment as being you, you've got to use your hands. You know, you, you know that, that's so. At the age of sixteen in Scotland, you pick your subjects for for your further education and your exams. At the age of fourteen, at the age of fourteen, Adam, I, I was probably any other kid. I had no idea what the hell I wanted to do when I left school. Uh, it was two options for me. I loved the outdoors, so working in the forestry as a ranger was one option. And the other option put to me by my uh, school housemaster, who was my education consultant and, and employment consultant, was the army. So I, I had this laser-like focus, join the military, that was it. You don't need to think about anything else. Just excel at languages, be a good shot, and hey, what else is it to learn? And I was in cruise control and got through school, but at the same time, my family said, well, I think you should learn a trade. 
you should learn you know, something, woodwork, metalwork, whatever. Now, in Scotland, the education system, you got a choice. When you did narrow your subjects down to seven, some of the choices were you could do German, but you couldn't do German and chemistry, and you couldn't do German and woodwork. You know, it, 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 they, they clashed. You couldn't do it. You pick, a, you pick one. You either pick something where you use your hands, or you pick something where you use your head. And I thought, well, I was still in army mode, and God only knows why I thought German would, would help me, rather than Russian or whatever. But I, was, I excelled at German. I forfeited woodwork and metalwork and technical drawing and chemistry, all the stuff I, I, I thought was quite interesting to do languages. But in one last gasp of trying to cling to a trade, and my family said, look, look, you've got to get a job. You've got to leave school when you're 16. I said, I don't want to leave school when I'm 16. I want to go on for one more year and get my, my hire so I can go to, to university or whatever. And I said, no, you, you've, got to, you've got to get a trade, man. That, that's, there's an old saying, and you probably heard it, that you can't polish a tub. And, and I was very much a tub. I hate to admit it, but in, certainly in terms of using tools and rudimentary things for making stuff. I was bloody, I was, I was hopeless, awful. And uh, I remember just, just to keep the peace, uh, we, there was a, a college uh, nearby where they did a craft apprenticeships. So you could leave school at 16, they would put you through a two to three year apprenticeship and that would make you attractive in, to, to, the, to the manufacturing industry in Scotland as it was. And it turned up, they said, when you come to the interview for this college, you got to bring an example of your woodwork and you've got to bring an example of your metalworking skills. Now, I was in luck because I had an example of both. So I turned up at this, this interview on a, on a Saturday morning, it was raining. It's always raining when it's bad news. I had a bottle opener. Now, metalwork, I had a bottle opener key ring that I had hand crafted from aluminium. Black oil dipped it as well, so it was black and it would never rust, although even I knew then that aluminium didn't rust, but aluminum didn't rust. Anyway, my bottle opener, which could never open a bottle because I'm so useless at operating machinery that the, the splines they used for opening the bottle were too wide, so it never opened a bottle, but it looked like a bottle opener. And I just hoped to hell that the guy interviewing me didn't try and open a, a bottle of beer during the interview, I was, I was goose. The other artifact from my collection that I took with me to show my skill in how to saw things and how to get do dovetail joints and varnish shit was a cassette holder for putting cassettes in. Now, like a complete idiot when I measured this thing up, because again, I'm a dull art when it comes to technical drawing. This, this thing was beautifully crafted. The dovetail joints were nice, everything was beveled off, there was no sharp edges, and it, and it sat with pride of place on my bookshelf in my, my, my room back home. But it could never accept a cassette because I'd measured it wrong. It, the, the cassette was too, it, what, what it, was, it would go in, but it couldn't, it was dovetailed so that these things sat on a ramp and they wouldn't fall off. And I'd, and I'd narrowed it so much at the back end, you couldn't get a cassette into it. You had to lay them on the side. So it was bloody useless. So I turned up at this, this in my best suit, which wasn't really a suit, but it kind of looked like a suit, with my bottle open, the key ring, and my, my cassette rack that could never hold a, a music cassette. And I'm sat there, and this guy, his father, and him helped him in with his artifacts. And he's got a golfer made out of metal, wrought iron metal with a club that he's made. And he's, he's welded it. He's actually welded this bloody thing with a five iron. His father brings a chair in that he's made, and he's actually, he's laid the legs, the spindles at the back of the chair. He made the whole plan. But like, like a dollar, I'm thinking, why is this guy bringing a chair? This chair's all round about me. Little did I know that this was, this is what craftsmen, people who were good at the trades, would bring to an interview. Not a key ring and a cassette holder. Another guy had brought a toolbox in, a cantilever toolbox. I thought, he's got the wrong idea. This is an interview. He will not ask you to make anything, son. But that's what he had made. He had made a box. He had actually fabricated a box with the levers, riveted it, the lot. 
needless to say, I didn't get that apprenticeship. I, I, I just looked at it, this is all wrong. This is not for me. So my first foray into understanding that the trades are very necessary, right? Construction is very, very necessary. My, my departure into a completely different field had left me cold on, on that front. I know how to use a hammer, and I still know how to saw a piece of wood, but the, there is a skill level and, and there is a technique level. The thing that struck me was what the hell was I being taught in school? That the product and the output of my education, which was the same as everybody else, was a bottle opener that didn't... And a cassette rack, the, the looked like a cassette rack, would never hold it. When other schools and other places were churning out toolboxes, chairs. One guy had done a coffee table. And I thought, vanished, completely vanished. And I thought, there's a skill level there. And, and if it's not being taught to the right, not the right level, but to, to the same standard level across the piece, is it any wonder that people's perception of what you know, a carpenter would do or what a, a metal worker would do is, is maybe perhaps jaundiced by the experience you have in school. And there's another old joke, you know, the Scottish comedian makes a joke about, about this, the technical, it's maybe wrong, it's, it's stereotyping and it's wrong, but it's funny. The technical <laughs> teachers in Scotland usually are hung over and usually just give you like a, a file and a saw and say, oh, go off, here's a piece of wood, here's a piece of mahogany, get it up on that, that, that lathe and, and turn it and then make a bowl or something, and that's it. But let, let me just get rid of this hangover while you're doing that, you know? I don't know that that is true or not, but that, that was my first foray into... Uh, it's not, not even bullshit, it was just my education went, went a different path to, to construction, to what would we be regarded as trades. And, and, I, and I've noticed educationally that, that we've moved from that to... It's much, much easier now to, now to, for gaming and app creation and software design we have a generation now where kids are very good with their thumbs they're very good at you know playstation and, and xbox and, and they're in that mode that, that you know i can sit in my backside with a set of headphones on and i can create value so when you say to them well yeah but you know, how about making a nice table for you to put that xbox on oh geez no forget that you know. I wouldn't know which end of a hammer to use. And, and I think some of that has got to come back. I mean, there's a, a lovely departure into getting infants to think with Bob the Builder. You know, it's great, but we need to keep on top of that and, and just make sure that true value is seen from what that, that happens. My son said he's getting married tomorrow, but he was the branch manager of a, a plumbing company. In, in town, We're quite a big a specialist branch of the construction and building industry and into the plumbing and hardware and bathrooms and, and boilers and whatever. And I went to pick him up one, one night, I thought I picked him up a few nights just to go for a coffee or whatever. And I, I look around and I, and I look at the cars and the, the, the vans, the vehicles that are pulling up outside a plumbing merchant to pick up you know, a brass pipe or a boiler or any amount of type of hardware or whatever. And these guys are driving, you know, $80,000 Ford you know, Ranger. And I'm not talking basic model. We're talking top end, blacked out you know, windows, big chunky tires, 60, 70,000 quids worth of vehicle outside a plumber's merchant. And that's the image that kids need to see. You know, they see the cars driving, you know, you see a, a car like that driving in there. And, and these guys, sorry, as an aside, Adam, that's what they turn up to work in. They're also driving around in the, the Merc SLK or the Porsche Boxster or whatever at the weekend. But when you see them, you, you, they don't make that, kids wouldn't make that assimilation that, that that guy fits boilers or that guy's a plasterer or that guy, you know, is a chippy or he's a carpenter, an electrician. Yeah, and he, that, that's the side people see. And, and to make it, what's the word I'm looking for? To make it attractive and appealing, that that's the lifestyle. It's not 
running about with a hammer hanging off your tool belt and a saw down your inner leg. That, that's, that's part of the image. But in reality, you can earn a really good living. People will always need people who can construct. And, and, I, and I look at it and think, that's the bullshito that, that we need to put, cut through educationally. So for me, it's really worthwhile now explaining where this bullshito term comes from that, that I gave you. Unless you, you get a question around that that you want to ask me. I've got a ton of questions. I've got five post-it notes here, plum full. I, I love the fact that you just dive right in. In, introduction, bang, let's go. I think you're the first yeah. person I've never introduced, Great. which is so fine with me because that's just how we flow. I do agree 100% with your evaluation on skilled trades or craftsmen uh, and women as far as the need for their services. A society doesn't operate without skilled trade workers. And you don't have a roof over your head, teachers aren't teaching. Doctors aren't healing. Judges aren't instilling justice. I love the shout out for your son, the plumber. And you're right. These folks are making a lot, a lot of money in, in these trades. And you start factoring in overtime. And again, they've got a, a quality that they work with their hands. And, and they'll never be out of a job. Because can you imagine what it would be like if your house did not have plumbing in it? You would call a plumber really fast yeah. i promise you that, that's called a cave and it's wrong it's first world problems you can't imagine not having a shower in the morning no it's that and, and it's when it breaks we, we take these things for granted and it's when it breaks and all of a sudden when it's winter and the boiler's not working and you're scrabbling around and you're thinking geez i need a plumber i need a boiler i need somebody to fix this boiler where does it go and, and yeah, it's 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 bullshit. Though. We need that appreciation all year round, not just when it's, there's not plumbers and, and boiler fitters in glass cases all over the UK and the US. Just smash the glass when you're in trouble, and, and boiler man will will come and bail you out. We need to be thinking carefully about this all the way through, you know, and and, and training people that can do it because there, there is scarcity. And people say, oh, I had to get a boiler guy out, and, and he cost me a fortune. Yeah, he did, because you put your son into university to learn about bloody software design. Yep. You know, maybe, maybe if he trained some more boiler fitters, then the price would come. <laughs> I don't want to dis well, really disturb this to people that, that do it. But, don't you know, give away too many secrets now. We'll be, uh, they'll be teaching uh, boiler making back in, in school now. You alluded to it a couple of times, and the no bullshito is a key part of this. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of lean consultants in the construction world that have introduced some bullshito. But I want to hear it from you because it, it came directly from you. There's an article you wrote out there on LinkedIn that's fantastic, and I love tagging people, bringing them to it. Tell us a little bit about this no bullshito concept. And thank you again, by the way, for allowing me to r and it to rip and deploy no, I, I, listen, uh, it? It's not, it's not exclusively mine. I, I don't know if I can say this in your podcast, but you know, I will, I'll say it once and then you can edit it out. But it's nicer to say no bullshito in LinkedIn and a professional community than, than no BS. You know? uh, I thought I had to choose my words carefully. But I thought, I thought wait, the first time I used it, I thought, yeah, there's a resonance there. There's a bit of history there. Let, let me just go back a bit. As part of this drive that I had to be better than everybody else, I spent a lot of time in martial arts when I was a kid. Not to defend myself, but just to push myself hard and, and, and prove that I was better than I thought I was. And, and I always tried to make sure that there was only one separation between me and Japan. That I was getting, getting the world, the knowledge, the essence firsthand. Maybe with one step of dilution, but, but not, not five stages of dilution because the message gets lost. I was very keen that you, you're taught by, you know, my, my sensei's sensei was Japanese or, or from Asia. And I always try to keep that as a kind of quality standard. And in, in the US, there's a plethora of, in martial arts fields, a plethora of, of dojos creeping up where, you know, People get a yellow belt and say, shit, I can make some money here making, you know, teaching people self-defense. Uh, and they'll 
there'll be a yellow belt. They'll have done some. Okay, I'll start my own dojo now. I'm, mo- I'm moving. My, my day job's taking me to a different town. Nobody knows me. I'll open up a, a Mac dojo. So in the US, you've coined this phrase for pop up martial arts fields called Mac dojos because they're everywhere. You know, populated and fronted by people who don't know what the hell they're talking about, who perhaps watched a, a Bruce Lee movie and, on YouTube and bought a fancy pair of pyjamas, and all of a sudden they're a, they're a self-defense expert. Just be like water, right? Just be like yeah. water. Yeah, mind, mind like water. Yeah, brilliant. I'll savor that tonight over a glass of water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they talk like that as well. They're on YouTube. You, know, you, you go to YouTube and just look at some of these weird and fantastic uh, techniques that I was taught the breath of death. I can defend myself with the stare and not you out. What a load of bullshit, though. And that's where the term came from. Is this is it's a play in the word bushido, which is obviously the way of the warrior. But bullshido is just the way of the, the bullshitter. Uh, and and that that is that's technically where it came from. So fast forward into to modern environment. There are so many people out there, there's so many phrases, catchphrases, retreading of old tires that it's just pure bullshit. And I, and I try and call it out, I try and call it out professionally. I even lean, I'm going to say lean is a label that is given to a bunch of tools. And I get the lean thing. A guy in 1988 had it in an MIT study, used the word once. Two guys think, what a great idea. We can build a book around that lean thinking. And bosh, all of a sudden, the world's woken up to lean thinking in 1992. Hell, we were talking about that in 1985 at Nissan and never used the word lean once. Even lean could be seen as a fad label. So under the bullshit, the no bullshit title, there's, there's a lot of other hashtags I use. Fad wars. Yeah, theory of constraints has got to fight. It's like the, the clash of the titans. Lean versus theory of constraints versus some six sigma, lean sigma, jeez. And it becomes almost too much. So Bushido, some of the things that feed into that for me, the misuse of Japanese ways to convey a, a basic business ethic in a way to make money. I'll give you an example of that. Please. It's a bunch of statistical tools that people use to an advanced level of uh, problem solving uh, suite of tools that people use to, to solve problems. And it can be design of experiments, it could be different uh, ways of going around that using very detailed statistical tools. Uh, and then, and then it, you can apply DMAIC to that, define, measure, analyze, and improve control. No, I don't have any hang ups with DMAIC. It's a sensible way to unpackage stuff. But where I do get hang ups is attaching another label to that and calling it Lean Sigma. Because obviously Lean wasn't good enough and all the tools within it good enough. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll we need to we need to add some statistical tools so that's what we'll call it Lean Sigma. And that's what happened in year 2000. And obviously Six Sigma wasn't good enough because it doesn't appeal to the Lean aficionado. So making this this Lean Sigma, it, oh, what, a, what a war winner. It's the best of both. It's actually the best of both and, and it's the worst of both. Uh, lean, lean takes a whole load of, uh, to be honest and frank, work study, work measurement, method study, and industrial engineering tools. The myth is that this was all born in Japan. Some of it was, but it's been misused and, and misrepresented a lot of the time. And the toolkit becomes what lean's all about. And, and if, if it is, then that's kind of wrong because the, uh, nothing is merely a toolkit. Uh, and the second point to that is that the tools, a lot of these tools are derivations of tools that existed before. Value stream mapping, what diagram and a good material process map? You know, I, I've seen some really well-structured process maps. It told me an awful lot more about the way the business was run than a VSM. So, so that, 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 that's a, a suite of tools. The, the thing it misses is what about the people? And what about the strategy? And how do you develop the culture? And how do you develop the mindset behind all that? It's not, and people gravitate to the toolkit and, and they lose it. And to keep the thing sweet and to keep it interesting, and as I said before, to make money, let's give everybody a belt. So a black belt, depending on where you go, if you shop around, the black belt can be three weeks, 
$16,000 and you'll get a black belt. And, it, and it's probably got a body of knowledge behind it and, and you'll be well taught in the, the world of statistics and how to apply it and how to run projects and QF, you know, quality function deployment, design experiments to Gucci, whatever, packet burn memory, everything, the whole nine yards. Or if you're a Scotsman and you don't want to put your hand in your pocket, you can buy your black belt for 30 bucks on, on eBay on a, on a CD. They're, they're flying around there as well. I saw one last week about a combined course, green and black belt, five weekends. Really? So in five weekends, I, um, I get my green belt and my black belt. Another thing that tickles me around that is a green belt course is 48 taught subjects in a two-week period. You can only really give a subject maximum two hours in that period, maximum. So what chance, if you go on a green belt course and you come out and Adam says, I've got my green belt now, and I say, wait, Adam, off you go and do a DSM on this, this whole facility, a new factory where we're thinking of looking at. Adam's done two hours of VSM training in a green belt. You haven't done, you've done jack, whatever. You're in no you're, position to lead it, for sure. Here's a hammer and a couple of nails. You go and nail a few planks together and then go and build me a house. It's that kind of you know, difference. And, and, and the bit that I, I cry Bushido on is the belt structure. You know, it, I came from a martial arts background. The belt meant nothing. My sense is it's, not, it's literally for holding your, your gi closed. Or if in judo, it might be something I can hold on to to hold you on the mat, and, and the colour doesn't really matter. There are some, even in martial arts, it's, it's a bit of bullshit though, because it shows progression. You go yellow to your green, into your brown, into your, your blue, then the black, or whatever, whatever persuasion you may be. Come in as you're dressed, Adam. If somebody broke into you, your house through those curtains right now, they're not going to wait until you nip upstairs and slide into your silk kimono <laughs> kung fu pajamas uh, and then be put off by the fact that you're tying a, a black and red tag at the side. Oh, oh shit, we can't mess with this guy. He's full on. Same in a pub or a club or a street. Nobody's saying, hang on there a second, let me don my, my belt and then you won't mess with them. You've got to take it as it is. And I guess that's that's where I stand out on me and Colin Bushido on LinkedIn about the belt structure. I even wrote an article on it that it means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. And that the continuous striving to better yourself and to aim for the next level or the next level of understanding and that understanding that you'll never get there. That you know, Bruce Lee did say that in a movie that don't don't concentrate on the finger, concentrate on the, the heavenly body behind that. And that and that's. And there's no belt structure attached to that. So what you find is people saying, well, it's a green belt project. No, no, it's not a green belt project. It's an everybody project. Everybody. You, if you're looking around waiting for a green belt to do that, then you're, you're missing the boat. That boat has sailed. Continuous improvement is, is getting everybody on the same page at the same time. So I get hang-ups with Broshido in, in that, that phrase. Another one, the, the belt, belt structure I struggle with. I struggle with kata. I really struggle with kata. You know, having done endless kata as a martial artist. To use the term to signify a routine or a, a, a mechanism of working, a standard way of doing something. I can't Is this get kata it. like K-A-T-A, Toyota Kata? K-A-T, yeah, K-A-T-A. Okay. Yeah, I, I get it, I get it. But I, I think I would struggle to go to Toyota and, and, you know, and talk to somebody and say, show me your kata. I think, I think they do, we, we label what they do with nice Japanese words. Maybe I'm wrong, I'll, and if I'm wrong, I'll, I will eat humble pie. But I, I, I shrink back from any of my Japanese teachers in Japan, at Nissan. When I, if I said, do I, get a, do I get a black, after all the statistical training you gave me in Taguchi analysis and design of experiments and stuff, do I get a black belt? They would laugh. What the hell do you want a black, what, what do you want a belt for? What, what, what are you talking about? Nobody that I've ever met in Toyota, Nissan, Honda, Kawasaki have even, are even interested in, in belts, you know, not interested. And that's why I think we, that's what I call it Bill Shido, is that we label stuff that they do, which is good sense, good common sense, and make, you know, yes, do the tools. But I find the fad labeling a bit, you know, divisive, and it, it, pro it prohibits people from being involved. I ain't get involved with this green belt project. But it should be everybody's job. That's one of my markers for Bushido is 
that's wrong. And, and the more people promote it, the more I'll talk out about it. So. Yeah, and you and so for what it's worth, that's how I met you. You called yeah. a little bullshito on me on LinkedIn, if you remember. Well, it's, it's maybe worth sharing that with, with your audience, that the, 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 the video in question was a guy where he was using a forklift. It wasn't even a forklift truck. It was just a forklift lifting sa heavy sacks of something up to a height where he could pick the bag up onto his neck and then walk up a very narrow plank into the back of a lorry and everybody in this video who witnessed the video was saying oh great what a great kaizen idea uh, what a great one well, that saves that guy having to lift that heavy sack onto his back and everybody was saying great kaizen wow wow what a great idea necessity is of the mother of innovation and all this bullshit and that's where we adam and i crossed swords he, he thought i was having a pop at him uh, <laughs> and, and I think once I, once I can explain my position offline, not, not in the public forum, that look, you've got to look at the big picture there. All that mechanical assistance is doing is speeding up the process. I break that guy's neck. Yeah. Uh, adding so, more risk to the equation. Yeah, well, I'll take that away. Make it hard for the guy to carry 40 kilograms on his C-spine. And, and you'll guess what? He'll kick back and say, shit, I ain't doing that. That's too tough, but we're making it easy for him to help himself. So, yeah, and for what it's worth, uh, we did, we talked outside of the public forum and that's when we really connected and I, I gained a deep found respect for you. You may not be much of a handyman as you described earlier. I think you said something about a uh, polished yeah. turd there. I'm curious, but you did end up making a, a solid career in lean and... Okay, no, but I, I think that was my first foray into the world of lean or TPS was, was working in a US uh, electronics company. And this is, this is another Bill Shido point that back in 1986, I turned up at this factory uh, and it was four bare walls, it was nothing, there's no racking, literally nothing, not even a paper clip. Uh, and we had to get this system up and running. The co company based out of Anaheim in California, we were the European manufacturing arm, brand new site in Scotland. And uh, we built it around the key elements of Toyota production system, mainly because my boss was ex-Toyota from South Africa, uh, pardon me. And uh, he said, right, let's design this factory the way we want it. And these are the principles that actually get brilliant. So we built it, Toyota production system. And, and I was suckered into thinking it was that easy. Mm -hmm. Then I went to join Nissan a few years later, sent to Japan, told to forget, empty your mind, you know, grasshopper, empty your head, go and learn. Don't take any of this bullshit with you. Go and learn what they've got to teach you. And when I came back, it's, I suddenly realized that this is never going to work. Lean is never going never to work in a brownfield site. Never. And there's a few success stories. I'm going, to, I'm going to classify this. There's a few success stories. Dan Hurt, back in the mid-80s, late 80s, through Matt Deluzio, uh, the other key guys, worked very closely with the Shingi Jitsu Institute. And they, they put Lean into Jake Brake under Mark, and then, then into the rest of Dan Hurt. Mark, Mark created the Dan Hurt business system, which is probably a... The, the, the best application of TPS principles outside of the automotive industry into you know, a fairly mixed bag of product ranges in the last 30, 40 years. It was a perfect storm, perfect timing. The main, the guy in charge of that facility was Art Byrne. Everybody's heard of Art Byrne. He brought Lean to the US. Oh, yeah. Art Byrne, you've got Delucio, you've got Koenigsegg, you've got all these guys at the right place, at the right time, with the Shingi Jitsu Institute, just coming out of Toyota, with a, a level playing field, just come and do it. Brownfield, Schmownfield, we're going to do this. And they did it. And, and it was perfect. And the, the big problem that everybody's got looking over the last 25 years inwards to that is that that's very difficult because they don't have the perfect storm. They don't have the dream team on site. They don't have the Shin Jitsu Institute, just on site, willing to come in and work all the hours and, and blow out Pratt & Whitney at the time to come and work with, with, with Jake Bray. 
So people are looking at thinking, how do I do it? So they default then to the tools and they do a, a bit of SMED or a bit of 5S or they might dabble with standardized work and then they realize that standardized work is quite a difficult one. Or in tact time, or, or, or tact time is difficult as well in, in that kind of you know, parlance. And the Bushido idea is that people look at TPS and all the books with Toyota in it and think, all I need to do is absorb that and, and it'll plug and play. Toyota have been doing it for 70 years. They've been doing it by a workforce that don't necessarily lose their jobs. You know, they're, they're, they've been there for quite some time and, and they've got a, a, a strong affinity for the company. It's family owned and, and they've just been doing it. They've been refining it, they're deming input at the beginning and they've just refined and refined and refined. We come along and we, we open the commodity and we look in and we think, oh, we want some of that. And the only thing we can really get readily is the tools. Oh, SMED, one piece flow. Yeah, but what about linking that to your strategy? Uh, you need to recruit people into that mindset because people have got a mindset. I'm going to work eight to five and then I'm gone. Don't ask me to work overtime, I'm gone. Don't ask me to work to a drum beam. No, and I'm gone. I, I like being able to walk off the job, have a cigarette and come back. I like that. That's part, that's part. Different mindset. Yeah, I'm just curious. So you're starting to get into some like true lean principles and I love where the conversation's heading and I want to steer it back a little bit to construction and you do have a good taste for both. What of the lean principles and you mentioned you're not gravitating towards the tools, really focusing in on people and culture and that sort of thing. I guess, how can construction better utilize lean principles or what is your recommendation just from having a look into both sides of things? How can we better apply lean manufacturing tools, concepts, strategies into the construction? I was struck yesterday. I saw it. It's one that does the rounds, Adam. You've probably seen it. It's five guys stood around a hole. Yeah. And, and, and Adam is in the hole with a, a hard hat, a toe tech, there's a high vis vest, and it says Adam, the digger. And then there's five guys right about this, and you've got Billy, the supervisor, half hat, clipboard, you know, Joey, the architect, you get Peter, the, the supervisor, supervisor, you know, you get Andrew, who's doing so, all these guys, and it says, uh, guys, we're going to make, we're going to increase productivity, we're, we're going to go lean, we're going to do whatever the hell, Adam, you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 the, and this is the, the, the lean principle that I want to get to there. The first thing to, to think about Everybody looks at that joke and says, it's the old adage, five people stood around a hole watching one guy work. And it, you can go to any construction site on the roads or whatever in the UK, you'll see that. Oh, that's good. I'm going to come to proper construction, it's more proper, but building construction in a second. Everybody knows that, that and laughs at it and think, yeah, we, we, too, too many management, not enough. The lean thing is, well, what is, if we were to do that, and if we were to say, we don't do we need a supervisor. We have to look at what is it that needs to happen in construction to put a guy in the hole, to put a guy in the in the, the crane, to put a guy on the bulldozer or whatever. What are the regulations? And you find that all of a sudden those five guys are actually necessary. The and if you if you took three of them out, all right, Adam's still digging a hole. But he's digging a hole where Andrew, the architect, told him to dig the hole, hopefully. He's digging it to a depth that the, the health and safety guy has told him to dig to because there's power cables or there's a pipeline. So there's all sorts of other stuff. He's not just digging a hole. He's digging a hole to a set of regulations and constraints and, a, and an operating system that has asked him to go and do that one point. So when we come to look at how do we become lean, it's not about digging faster and giving Adam a bigger spade. It's not even about giving Adam a, a machine that helps him to dig that hole faster. It's how do we look at the regulations, the information, the, it's back to the project management per se, because to be honest, automation in, in the construction industry is quite well developed in terms of how it used to be. And it's looking at, at some of the, what people would regard as the overhead the non-value add, but which is necessary. And I think one of the lean principles I'd be looking at in terms of construction would be the three categories of work. Value adding work, where you are putting one brick on top of another, you are 
nailing a piece of you know, ply board into a wall or drywalling something, or you are putting some slates on a roof, or you are fixing two pieces of timber together to make a joist, that's the value add. That's where something is being transformed. The material that someone is buying or living in or habiting has got, is being made. There's other stuff that has to happen, which is unavoidable. I need to go and mix cement. I just pour it. It doesn't just you know, beam in from Starship Enterprise ready to go. I've got to mix my cement and whatever. So that, that may be non-value adding, but unavoidable. And there'll be a load of tasks in there, like some of the architect tasks, some of the electrical fitting tasks, some of the plumbing tasks. You've got to get things prepped to fit. Unavoidable. And then there's some tasks and work that needs to be looked at across the whole spectrum of construction activity. That you'd say that that that's just avoidable, really. We need to question that because that's the bit that takes time. Time in construction is money and labor and people in meetings and, and all sorts of stuff. And, and if you're like any other meeting structure I know, try and get nine planets to align on a certain day at a certain time, it's, you forget it. It's like you know, herding cats or herding wasps. That'll never happen. Monkeys uh, herding uh, house flies. <laughs> Uh, so, so that puts delays in as well and, 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 and the thing with construction is if you miss a beat you, the whole thing misses a beat you know, it, it's, not, it's not like a Toyota principle where you, you sort the line and you solve the problem construction is a bit different to that it, it, it's, there's no line to stop there's a process where we, we can't fit that because of a, a regulation or the material hasn't turned up or whatever what do you do? You've got really to actually sort the job and wait, or you do a work of it and you build something out of sequence, and then all of a sudden your planning is is you know out the wazoo there. You know, it, it, so so the lean principles that, 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 that we've got like flow, seek perfection, you know, respect for people, all of the lean principles. There's some that, that do cross over quite readily. Respect for people. I, I totally get that and working with, with people in that environment, which is a harsh environment, this health and safety, the OSHA stuff, is going to be part of it. Now, that all, in terms of respect for people, probably safety is what front and centre. And, and I say construction here, Adam, because we, we, you can look at it from US and, and you know, European uh, lenses, but a lot of the construction work that I see, I've seen JCB diggers on top of buildings, with jackhammers knocking down, how the hell did it get up there? And you, you, you just, you would, it just would not happen. And it's not a criticism, but until people see that, that, that in construction, that's a, that's a big no-no. Life's not that cheap. Uh, you just don't do it with that. And that, that's, a, that's a respect for people piece. Bring it, bringing it back, some of that flow is different. I know, I know that you've been concentrating quite heavily on, on tax planning and looking at tax buckets and other Fantastic. And, and it's using a lean term in a completely different way. You know, it, it's, it's slightly, it, it's very different to a tactic where everything's moving past a fixed point to a, at a rate, you know, whether it's one piece low every 40 seconds or whatever. I know that when you look at the, the train, the carriage, that, I love the analogy. It's slightly different. It's whatever you want to call it, it's work balancing and making sure that you've got the right resources in the right time at the right place to make sure that you don't over overstate the time and, and, and creep the next uh, production stage or, or, or phase. So I think that there's definitely crossovers. I think the, but, but the, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a clean mirror. In the same way that lean doesn't immediately go into healthcare in the same way. There's some things you, that, that, that do, but a lot of things that don't. Uh, and, and calling it lean healthcare. I, mean, I know Mark Delizio, he I and mean, I talk about this quite a lot, that where, where, do you, where do you stop putting the word lean in front of stuff? Healthcare and lean aerospace. Uh, it doesn't matter. But again, the point is that you boil it back to the basics, back to the essence. What the hell is it about? Is it lean or is it the tools, the techniques and the mindset that you, we, we can carry over. And, and I've been trying to get people to think back to that, to the basics. Because for me, anything that's not back and, and hooked 
into the basics. The essence is Bushido. And well, what, is the, what is the basics or what is the essence in, in your words? I like to boil it to three things. Strategic alignment. Don't call it strategy deployment, strategy planning, quotient canary, just strategic alignment. Know what you're going to do, know how that's going to be cascaded, get it owned by the, the people who have to deliver it at every level, involve them in the process so that there's joint objectives setting. It's not me giving you objectives, Adam, it's you and your, your peers. An interesting article this week saying that we're, it's ridiculous to think we can plan five years out or three years out. And strategy deployment and strategy planning, strategy creation has always thought that three to five year strategy, long term. We live in a VUCA world. You know, your five year plan went down to Swanee when the pandemic. When we stop getting semiconductors, your five year, guess what, Toyota, Ford, GM, Volkswagen, whatever, your five year plan is no longer valid. Forget it. You're not in control of five years. You're not Gypsy Rose Lee looking at the crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, it don't yeah. happen like Five years allows a lot of variation to creep in there. Jeez, yeah. And so the, what, what, the, what the latest thinking is, let's be really, not, not agile in terms of software development, agile and flexible in our thinking. Let's train our leaders to see risks as they come and act swiftly upon those risks almost on a, on a six monthly yearly cycle because that, that's the time frame. Let's start to navigate through the ice in, on shorter time scales and, and make that the, the, the cycle of, of looking at it. You can still look over the horizon, but don't put the same credence, investment or trust that you're, even your best thinking five years from now is going to even be 80% there because it ain't. The life proves that. And then we're still surprised. We were churning out through Harvard or whatever, Oxford, Cambridge, all, all that MBA thinking. That's how you do strap learning. It's five years. Forget it. So for me, call it strategic alignment. Whatever the time scale may be, understand where you have to be at a certain point in time what you and, and who your stakeholders are, who is you're trying to you know, deliver excellence for, whether it's the shareholder, the employee, the customer, the society, whatever. But get that strategic alignment sorted. Then you concentrate on the toolkit. The tools, what are they, the things that I have my golf bag? Once I've decided strategically I'm going to play, my mother told me I need to have a good hand-eye coordination and I need to play with a ball and whatever. Do I play pool? Do I play snooker? Oh, no, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go and play golf. So once I've decided that strategic alignment, what tools do I need? I'll go and get my golf bag and I'll populate that with the tools that I need to do the job. The Bushido is, there's people out there that say, oh, Adam, you need, you need 25 clubs in that bag, my friend, and we'll give you a belt for each one of them. Yeah, and if that's Bushido, you know, if you go to a pitch and putt, you've got a putter and one iron, that's it. And you go with the kids and you have a great time. Will you score any more, score any less? If you're a normal golfer, then five clubs probably. You, if you said, if I told you, you come to the UK, I'll pay for it, Adam, bring your best three clubs. Adam would have a reasonable game of golf in the UK with three clubs, save the way. So pick, pick a toolkit that, is, that will deliver the goals that you need to, to deliver. Don't be, don't, be doing, don't be training black belts and all that bullshit, though, because you don't need it. What do you need? And the third element is your people engagement. Giving people the empowerment, the training, the permission, if required, to actually use those tools to deliver the strategic goals. And, and in that, some principles, some non-negotiables there are fail. It's okay to fail early, fail often. Because if you don't fail, you don't learn. Le learning is through failure. So I, I'm going really to encourage my people, here's your tools, I'm going really to encourage you to use them. This is, we've agreed some months back, this is where we want to take the business or, or the site or whatever. It's your ideas that are going to help me get there. And, and we work as a team to, to solve the problems that you face every single day of the week. Get those three things and just do them religiously. And you'll all of a sudden, you'll, you'll, you'll start to move the cultural needle some way towards where it needs to be. But when we concentrate on, oh shit, I can't do that strategic planning. That's, 
there's a problem, I'm going to get an X matrix and I'm going to drive it like this and I'm going to, oh, oh, people panic. So they don't do it. And they don't even talk about it. So we lean then gravitates down to a toolkit because we can do that. That's lucky. I can train people in SMED. It's five steps or 5S or 9S. Here's another Bushido point. You know, 5S was fine. Why do we need nine and 10 of these things? But anyway, it's seven wastes. It's now eight wastes, eight wastes. Now it's 12 wastes. Yamada, who was taught by Ono, says there's only three wastes. And I actually, I'm, I'm coming at that thinking, I'm too old, I'm too crotchety now, I'm still an unpolished tub. And I look at it and think, there is only one way, there is only one Buddha, and that's time. Mm. Look at the seven wastes, every single one of them, if you indulge in any one of the seven Buddha, the only thing you, at the end of the day that you're wasting is time. Defects, I've wasted time making them. Waiting, I'm wasting time. Overproduction. I'm wasting time that can be used to make stuff that I actually do need. Yeah. Motion. Five classifications of motion. Class one is the finger. Class two is the wrist. Class three is the elbow. Four is the, the shoulder. Five is a walk. The lower the classification of motion, the less time it takes. So I want to move my motions. Now. Transport. If I'm moving stuff around a factory, it's wasting time. No added value to it. It's time. There's only one Buddha. The rest is Bushido. You know, <laughs> even Ono, Ono himself said, I don't know where this seven, seven ways came from. All I said was that there's, there's that many out there, they just go and Kaizen it, Kaizen the shit out of it. Right? There's so, so many. He says, I think somebody said, I may have said that seven's a good number. It's, you know, there, there was a saying when we, you know, every man has flaws of seven, we have seven or something. So it, it became seven. And the reality is, yeah, Ono himself, you know, it's, didn't know how many ways there were. I've, I've kind of worked out, I'm simple, I like to keep a basic one Buddha. Which makes sense with the no bullshito concept. I, I guess, tell, so I'm connecting some dots, right? I run into this as well very often. I've always had this urge to be better and do more and create more, be the best of the best. And I think a lot of it comes from being athletic back in the day and competition and sports and just this mindset has brewed in my life. At what point is enough? At what point do you hit the wall and say, you know what? Maybe it is bullshito, but do I just let this one slide? Or when is it enough in Davy's world? Uh, when do I take my ball home and say I'm not playing anymore? Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah, question. Yeah. It's. Uh, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something just related to that. Please, I'll take it off the wall. This is uh, this is a Scottish saying. Right. Welcome to my home, listeners. The, the ball ball, on the ball's on the slates, right? Sorry, go that way. The ball is the ball in Scottish. Okay. <laughs> on the slates is on the roof. Yeah. Okay. Makes so sense. when the ball goes up on the slates, that's it. It's game over. Ah. You can't. Be, sorry, guys. Some some idiot. You're playing foot soccer, football, proper football. If the ball goes up on the roof. Uh, and you can't play anymore, then that's it. Sorry, guys, game over. Some idiots just hoofed it, right? So this is a whole bliss situation. So when the ball's on the slates, I, I have, there's a few incidents on LinkedIn where people just keep recycling and regurgitating the same, the same slide, the same 9S slide, the same journey to... You start with, with 5S, then you do Kaizen, then you do Lean, then you do Lean Six Sigma, then you do DMAD V, for, for, and, and there's a tree, and there's a tree emblem beside this root. So the, the 5S is the low-hanging fruit, and then the further up the tree you go, you use the six. What utter, utter bullshito. It's, it's heart-dropping every time I see that. Uh, and... It is the, the point you just made. At what point does Davy Thompson say, shit, I can't look at this anymore. I'm done. I'm out of LinkedIn. This guy has worn me out. I was a rough stone at the beginning. I know I'm a smooth pebble. At his grinder. At what point does that happen? Truth is, I don't. I'll never let people bullshit me into, into submission. 
And that ain't going to happen. I will always call that one out. Because you have to, because there's people coming along, young guys who have never done lean before, straight out of uni, and they're looking at that thing, oh, what a great graphic, I'll use that. And off you go, and you're doing five S on a construction site, and the guys are saying, what the hell is that going to do? <laughs> what the hell? What, why, I don't want a shadow board, you idiot. I'm 16 floors up. You shadow boards on the floor. What, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You know, and, and that's that shadow boards, great idea. Again, can be real shadow. You know, where do you really need it? Like John Wayne does not keep his sex shooter on a shadow board. You know, it just didn't happen. You know, you never saw John Wayne and Clint Eastwood looking for the six shooters. They, okay. they knew where to keep the tools of the trade. Right yeah. there on the hill. Lee Van Cleef, I, I must admit, had the best shadow board, but that's by the by. But no, you don't give up. You, there is no point for that. There was a comment the other day about uh, you can't use perfection, the pursuit of perfection. That's what you can't use that because it, it, it's, it's, it's off putting. You know, you, you'll never get there. And I, and, I, and I commented on LinkedIn and I said, well, you, you can. The, world is the, the, the thing to get excited about isn't the noun, uh, the, the pursuit of perfection. It's the verb. It's the pursuit that's the important bit. Get in your head, you're never going to be perfect. You're not Scottish, so you'll never be perfect. Yeah, <laughs> I'm only joking. But you're, never, you're never going to be perfect, but there's absolutely no reason whatsoever that you can't be on that journey and make this day better than yesterday, tomorrow better than it is today, make the next five minutes better. That, that's a journey. So you've got to keep on that. You've got, you're going to get... You're going to get, you know, speed bumps where you get some numpty coming along and saying, yeah, 10S, it's twice as good as 5S. Really? No, it's not. And you can choose to just say, oh, yeah, all right, let's go 10S. Or you can choose to say, no, it's Bushido. Bushido, mate. Yeah, it's just, you know, I'm out, you know. I'll tell you, one of the things I'm a little envious of, you, you mentioned your senseis have always been one stage removed from Japan in construction, at least here in the U S I don't feel like we have many senseis that are out there. And so I feel blessed to have you as maybe a two removed from Japan. Uh, I'll counter that Adam. I'll counter that because we're talking about, you know, in terms of lean and, and no, no, bush, no bushido is just a tongue in cheek way of caught con and get people to think about the basics. Don't get don't always be looking at the next shiny thing. That's the Bushido part, yeah? So what, what's next after Six Sigma? Eight Sigma? You know, it's bullshit. The fact that construction is still kind of finding its way in this, and there's still, there's still huge technological advancements that are, that are moving the needle in terms of how quickly and how safely you can build stuff, the quality and the integrity of the thing that you have built after you've built it, that technology, is, is progressing all, all the time. And I think, I don't think it's acknowledged as much as it should be. That is big K Kaizen, Kaikaku, we're transforming the way that we go about it through, maybe through machinery, maybe it's through building materials or whatever. But the fact that there's no sensei in, in that field, there is, it's people like yourself, people like Schroeder, people like, who are, leading the way, who are at the edge, because you're in uncharted ground. The sensei is probably somebody who is he's like one chapter of the book ahead of the, the rest of the guys. He's one, he's the pioneer. He's the guy that's at the front, cutting the way through and, and getting the learning from that. I mean, it, it's still fledgling, but don't please compare the great with the Japanese guys that have been doing it for 40, 50 years and in, in, in making cars and probably making the same kind of cars for, for a long, long time. When you talk about construction, I, I think construction, and I had to learn this after talking to you and break my paradigm that construction, building, trades, wasn't a bottle opener and a cassette rack, yeah, or a, or a toolbox. Construction, I'm, I'm joking, was a bridge. It doesn't even need to have people in it. It could, it could be a functional item, a bridge. It could be a road, it could be a garage, it could be a fuel station, it could be a block of flats, a warehouse, it could be a racking... There's a myriad, and then within that, there's welding, there's joinery, there's electricians, there's plumbing, there's... 
that's supremely more complex than one something coming past your nose every 60 seconds or every 15 seconds. The senses that are good at doing that, yeah, they've been doing it for 50 years. Construction, as I say, is a brand new chapter, almost. I know people have been talking about lean construction for 20 years, but I, I still don't see a, a huge movement and people gravitating to the top to say, we're really at the leading edge here. People dabble with it by using tools from other industries to come in. What I like about what, what you guys are doing is you're creating your own suite and your own mindset. And it's back to that three, three things. What's the strategic alignment? What do you want Lean to look like? How do you engage the community, which is the, the people aspect? And what are the tools, the appropriate tools that we bring forward? It's inappropriate to say that works. That's what people's Lean toolkit is. We'll bring that across. How do you use the essence method study, work study, looking at timing, planning, all of these tools, the basis, I haven't used the word lean once with any of them, and bake them into the, the construction toolkit that gets things done safely, to the right quality standards, to the timeline that's required without absorbing too much resource and cost. That's it. There is no secret sauce here. You know? and, and the work that you're doing, I think I would, I would look at you three, four guys very heavily and say, you're the senseis. Don't be, don't be scared to use the title. Who else is, who, who's going to teach you? Can I get a belt with that sensei title? No, no, I'll give you a cummerbund <laughs> or a sporran. I'll, I'll send you a sporran. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've got a spare, I'm going to send you one. You've, you've, you've triggered me now, so I'm going to send you a sporran. <laughs> uh, oh, I look forward to it. I appreciate the kind words there, I guess. We're uh, we're hitting the hour, and I know you got something else. Is there anything that you want to get out there? That I don't. It wasn't about me self promoting or whatever. I, I, I just I'm gonna a catchphrase that wasn't mine, stolen remorselessly from my martial arts community. But it is on on what we what we talk about. And as I said, this was a very you know, maybe you just fill in some of the gaps. Of Bushido, where it fit, where no Bushido, where it fits in. What does it actually mean? And if I was to say to anybody, you know, the message to take from it is: if Bushido or no Bushido clicks you into a way of thinking, that way of thinking should be not to accept all that glitters is not gold. Uh, the, the, if it may be glittery, it may be a sexy belt, it may be a new name. A fancy catchphrase, a new fad label, whatever. But if, if it walks like a duck and it smells like a duck and it quacks like a duck, guess what? It's a duck, unless in some, unless some Bushido artist is, is trying to sell you a Labrador Retriever. It's that's because that's Bushido. It, it, trust your guts with this kind of stuff. It's people are making a lot of money making the simple more complex and it shouldn't be about that. Yeah. I say a lot of the times the best things in lean are free. I think a lot of times people just put out the content out there because really it's all about that art of facilitation. It's that art of caring about people, understanding, being able to read a situation in the moment to determine what is needed. I, I often say, what you were talking about is the difference between implementing a tool and creating a tool on the job and really finding what is the need, what does the project have from a true value add? I think a lot of times if you sit there and ask yourself that question, that the answer will come to you uh, in mm -hmm. that moment in, in the form of a tool and not crowbarring something in just to make it fit. Uh, I think it qualifies as the Bullshito term, making yeah. sure that, you know, what we're doing is truly adding value and, and to your explanation of the principles earlier there's a book called lean thinking by womack and jones yes. that's exactly where my head went as you were describing value add non-value add but necessary and then straight non-value add yeah so anyway th this has been an amazing time i appreciate you so much no, no problem. allowing the catchphrase i i it, yours not yours again all due respect that is where i pulled it from i, I think I think the world of you, despite maybe you trolling me a little bit on LinkedIn. No, I, I, will, I will continue to troll you. If it, if it, if it, if it gets your respect, I'll, I'll troll you remorselessly. <laughs> but uh, but for, for my side, I thank you very much for the, the opportunity to talk on your, your podcast. I, I've 
I watched a few of the previous episodes and I think what you're doing is class leading and pioneering and, and that, that is, that's really important for the industry. So power to your elbow, Adam. It was, it's, it's been great to watch the, you, you move away from a day job, you know, a, a normal day job into doing this, which is your passion. And I find that when you're passionate about something, it pays off, you know, and that's what keeps you motivated, keeps you focused. But as I said, passion, keeping things simple, gets it done every single time. So thank you very much for the, the opportunity to talk. If, if any listeners or watchers or whatever want to reach out, touch me, you know, I have a disagreement, fine. I don't hide myself. It's, it's Davy at DavyThompson.com. Thompson is without a P. Happy to engage in, in fair debate and argument on any of the points we discussed. Yeah, and I would highly suggest folks to reach out because it is a good time and you will learn something as long as you approach it with an open mindset. Again, I'm grateful that we had the disagreement and we were able to hop on a video chat. And you, again, you've invested several hours of time into me and I'm very appreciative. And, 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 and vice versa. I mean, I've learned more about construction and where it's going today by those talks as well, Adam. So I thank you. It's, uh, it's certainly something I've, I've been pushing hard with people that I talk to bring back the trades and, and all, all that good stuff as well. You know, it, it, made, it made me realize that the people of a certain age in this country that maybe the perspective just needs to shift slightly. And you know, anything I can do to support that, I'll, I'll gladly do it. So. I love it. I value it. I appreciate you. Always a good time learning with you. And until next time, appreciate you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much, mate. All the best.